Well, we're continuing our study in the book of Mark. And last week we talked about the transfiguration on, on the mountain. Jesus was transformed. In other words, he was glorified. And the guys that were with him, saw they saw Moses and Elijah. And we saw last week that Moses and Elijah represent the law and prophets. And both of those were experienced or fulfilled in Jesus. And for them, that was an awesome experience. The people that were there were blessed by that experience. But as soon as it was over, they had to go back down from the experience and keep on learning from Jesus and using that to minister to others as well. Now, we ended last week with the acknowledgement that the Holy Spirit still uses people to operate in the gifts. How many believe that is for today, right? And the gifts in the Spirit in the church, and we are all blessed by that. We talked about in our class this morning that the Bible says in Ephesians that God gave pastors, teachers, and all that, what? To equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And that includes being used by the Holy Spirit in the church. So we need gifts and we need experiences, but we use those to grow and to get to where God wants us to go next. Now, when they were up there, God could have simply just spoken to it and said, listen to Jesus, right? He didn't have to show Moses and Elijah. He didn't have to show the transfiguration. He could have simply said, hey, guys, listen to him. But he didn't. He also included a supernatural experience to emphasize what he was trying to say. And we should expect both in our lives and in our services. Amen? We come expecting, right? We say that, we come expecting. Expecting what? We should expect experiences, but we also expect to apply those things to our life and change us. So the guys were heading down the mountain. Experience was over. Now what's going to happen? Well, we pick it up at verse 9, Mark chapter 9, verse 9 says, As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And again, just like the, all the other uh, commandments he gave them, don't tell anybody, except for the phrase, until the Son of Man was raised. That's the first time he's using that. So they had seen the glorified Christ that lasted for a moment. If they told everybody about this glorification, if they told them, hey, you should have seen what we saw in the mountain, man. We saw lights and glory in Moses and Elijah. If he'd have shared that, if they'd have shared that, what would have happened? All them followers that were thinking that he's the Messiah coming to overthrow Rome would have been energized. Oh, this is awesome. He's glorified. Now is our chance to take Rome, take it over. But remember, we talked about the order of things. The cross was first. Suffering is first, then comes the glory. You can't have a victory unless you have a battle. So they were going to experience the suffering first. Glory was going to come a little bit later. What they would have wanted to do was to bypass the cross and go straight to glory. And how many are like that? You just want to bypass the trial and get to the good stuff. But you never really appreciate the good stuff until you've been in the bad stuff. Now, you all know my feelings about the weather here. When we lived in Florida, you don't appreciate the nice weather because it's always nice weather. And you get kind of sick of the nice weather. But now you have winter and you have death and destruction and horribleness for three or four or five months. And so when spring comes, man, you are really anxious and you can't wait for it to happen. You forget about the 97 degree weather. You're just excited for it to be not winter again. And unless you have difficult situations in your life, you're not going to really appreciate the good things in your life because, oh, everything's good, nothing. You want to have the appreciation. And Jesus is saying, look, there has to be hardship first. Once the hardship's over, then you can really appreciate what God's doing. Since they would have wanted to bypass the cross, that's when he says, hey, wait till I'm resurrected. Because after the resurrection, then it's okay to reveal to everybody. Let them know because the suffering part would have been over. Jesus would have suffered, would have been raised from the dead. Okay, that part's over. Now let's get to the glory. And verse 10 says, they kept muttering to themselves, what does rising from the dead mean? Now, now they, uh, they obeyed, obviously, Jesus' instructions. They didn't say anything. We just won't have anything recorded. They didn't share that experience with everybody else but they were still kind of in the dark about what was going on. 
Now, the Jews at that time, they would have believed in a general resurrection. They believed that at the end there would be a resurrection. But it says here, they, they weren't quite sure of what he meant about this particular resurrection. Because it appears to them, you know, in his order of speech, he says, look, you can say this after I'm resurrected. In other words, okay, it's going to happen in my lifetime. So you're going to get resurrected, but nobody else is at this point. So they were really confused. And it doesn't go into any, any more detail about what they were curious about. And they didn't appear to ask Jesus any more, any more about it. So they kind of appear to keep that question to themselves. So now they go to verse 11. And they, said, they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? So it appears they just kind of dropped that first question about the resurrection from the dead. They didn't get it. So they get to the next question. They had just seen Elijah on the mountain. And they were wondering about all these prophecies about Elijah coming. Malachi 3.1 says, look, I am sending my messenger and he'll prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. And then Malachi 4 says, look, I'm sending the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. So they're saying, okay, we know these prophecies. Did that just happen? We saw Elijah. It, was this a fulfillment of these prophecies? Did, did we miss it? Was, was Elijah there and we just missed what he was going to do? Or maybe this, this isn't it. Did, did we imagine something? Is he not come yet? What's going on? They don't understand it. Now, the teachers in the, of the law and the Pharisees believed all these prophecies had to be fulfilled before the Messiah would come, right? And John had to correct that thinking. If you look at John, John 1 says, in verse 19 says, this was the testimony of John when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from the Jerusalem to ask John whether or not he claimed to be the Messiah. He flatly denied it. I am not the Messiah, he said. Well, then, who are you, they asked. Are you Elijah? No, he replied. So people at the time thought John was the Messiah. He had to correct that when they asked him about it. And when he said no, then they instantly thought, okay, he's the prophet that Malachi talks about. This is Elijah preparing the way for the Messiah. And he had to correct that as well. Now, he was not Elijah as we know. And Jesus answers their question. In verse 12, it says, Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Now, when he's talking about restoring all things, he's talking about leading people to repentance. When you lead people to repentance, that's beginning to restore them to a relationship with God. And basically, Jesus is saying, yep, Elijah comes first. He draws people to repentance. But that doesn't negate the fact that I'm still going to suffer. I'm still going to die. That's happening. Jesus is referring, referencing Isaiah 52 and 53 when he says these things, in verse, 20, in verse 12, back in Mark, it says, why then is it written the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected? Talking about Elijah. If, if Malachi's right and, and Elijah's coming first, why does Isaiah say that I gotta suffer? He says he hasn't come yet. John was preparing the way for him, not Elijah. Elijah's coming at the end. John 1, 23, back in John, says, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am, the one of the vo I am the voice of the one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. John said he wasn't the Elijah, but the Bible said he did minister how? In Luke 1, 17, talking about, Eli or talking about John the Baptist, and he will go on before the Lord, what? In the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord calling people to repentance. And John, or Jesus goes on to explain back in Mark now, in verse 13, it says, I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done everything that they wished to him, just as it was written about him. So again, he's referencing John the Baptist, saying he's technically not Elijah, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and they're doing to him all the things that they want to do. And they're talking about his imprisonment, and his ultimate death, and the suffering that John the Baptist went through in preaching about Jesus. And this is the stuff about Elijah is also a reference to Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel were kind of a foreshadowing of, of what was happening with John the Baptist. 
It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like, one, like that of one of them. So what is happening here, Ahab and Jezebel are foreshadowing Herod and Herodias. Look at their, their pattern. Ahab was kind of a weakling, kind of a wimpy kind of guy. Jezebel was the one who called the shots, right? She was the one who was more forceful. She was making him do things he really didn't want to do. Herod was also kind of a weak guy. And Herodias was the one calling the shots for him. Similar. Mark 9, 14 says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with him. So he's telling them, he's kind of giving them a heads up. Okay, this is what's happening to John the Baptist because people think he's Elijah, ministering in the power of Elijah. So just like Ahab and Jezebel, Herod and Herodias are going to do the same kind of thing to John the Baptist. And then he goes on and, and the crowd starts coming to him. So Jesus and the three are walking back to town. The other nine are surrounded by a whole crowd of people as he's walking back to them. And it seems that they're arguing with him. The teachers were arguing with him. And the, and the crowd was making fun of him. And the nine, these nine that were left behind, were being attacked from both sides. The people that saw them said, hey, you can't do anything. This guy has no power. He's not delivering my son from demons. The Pharisees were attacking him from the other side, taunting him. And it was in the, in the middle of this kind of a dust-up that Jesus is seen by the crowd. So they're all arguing with you know, the nine that were left behind. They see Jesus walking, and they kind of left the nine, and were walking to Jesus. And verse 15 says, As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Now it seems that the people ran to see Jesus, but the leaders and the Pharisees and the teachers did not. And they probably stood in the background with their arms folded, waiting for Jesus to trap himself. Now, the people that were walking to him, why were they overwhelmed with wonder? Well, most likely because the guys could not deliver this boy from the demon. And they probably figured, hey, Jesus could, so they left the nine and ran to Jesus. These guys can't do it. Let's go to the source. We're going to go find out if Jesus can do it. And so Jesus picks up on their argument, and he's trying to fix it. He hears them arguing, and he says in verse 16, what are you arguing about? And the crowd seemed to be yelling at the disciples because they could not heal that boy that was there. And the disciples were try trying to argue back and defend themselves when Jesus walked up. When he asked that question, verse 17 says, a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So Jesus asked the question, and the dad answers the question. And he goes into a pretty graphic detail of his son's issues. And again, once telling Jesus, these guys, they couldn't do anything. They had no power to deliver this demon. And you wonder, why couldn't they do it? Why? I mean, they were sent out to do just the same thing. In Mark 3, it says, He appointed 12, designating them as apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So he was, he, they were commissioned to do that. And then they were doing it. In Mark 6, it says, They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So if Jesus sends them out, they start doing it right, and now all of a sudden, they're not, they can't do it. Now, could it be that at first, they knew they had no ability in themselves to do it. They went out and they were prayed up and they were trusting that Jesus was going to do it. It's not us, man. It's Jesus working through us. We're going to do this. And as time goes on, and they're doing this time after time after time, it appears they became complacent. Hey, this is pretty cool. We don't need to pray much anymore. We're just, God's just using us, doing a great thing. They were trusting in their own ability, and they're not being totally reliant upon Jesus. And that Jesus seems to be rebuking them in that. Verse 19, talking to the disciples is what he's doing here. 
He says, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. One commentary says this about that verse. It's not too bold to presume that during the absence of Jesus and his three intimates, Peter, James, and John, a spirit of unbelief and laxity had overcome the disciples, perhaps partly as a result of conversations between them leading to their impotence. Now we're going to stop at that for a minute. These guys were doing great things and all of a sudden they're not doing great things. And most every commentary I've read, it appears and, it, and we see later on that Jesus tells them what it requires. But they began to do it, they thought, in their own ability. Hey, God gave us this gift. We don't need to pray. We already have the gift. Let's go out and do it. Now we read about miracles and healings in the Bible. But we might not see them as much today. Why not? Could it be that instead of trusting fully in what Jesus can do through us, we begin to think that the results are up to us? The faith he's talking about is not faith in yourself or even faith to be healed. It is faith in what Jesus can do through you according to his nature and character. I'm going to read a quote from a book I'm reading. The guy who wrote the book, his name is Jack Deere. Anybody ever hear of Jack Deere? He's, he's kind of up there. He was, he's still around. He's still teaching, but he's, he's retired for the most part. He is a prolific author and has been used mightily in the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you what he says. This one quote. Using the, another story in the Bible, the leper story. It says, in the second story, a leper came to Jesus and said to him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. That man certainly believed in Jesus' ability to heal a terminal disease. He freely acknowledged, you can make me clean. But he also understood something else about faith. He did not assume that he would automatically be healed simply because he believed in Jesus' ability to heal. He said, Lord, if you are willing. The faith that God requires for healing is not a psychological certainty that he's going to heal us, or those we pray for. It is faith in his ability to heal and in his good will will to heal. It is confidence that God loves his children and regularly heals them. It's not that they have this gift that once for all they have it all the time. It's something that you have to believe that God wants to do through you. It's not you, it's God working through you. And for that to work, you need to be really prayed up for God to do that. So he tells them to bring the boy. And verse 20 says, so they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it instantly threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. When the demon's confronted by God, he's fighting. And he's trying probably to kill the boy before Jesus can deliver him. How many of the demons know who Jesus is? And they know what Jesus can do. Luke 8 28 says, when he saw Jesus talking about demon, he cried and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Demons know who Jesus is and they know what Jesus can do. He knew he was going to be driven out of this boy. He probably tried to kill him before he did it. Jesus asked the boy's father in verse 21, How long has he been like this? Asking the father about his condition shows Jesus' concern from the boy. You've had to deal with something since birth with Noah. And it's like, how long is this going to go on? How long? And Jesus wants the father to answer him. And I'm sure when he answered him, in verse 21 it says, from childhood. I'm sure the man had emotion when he was doing that. Man, it doesn't say how old he is, but now it's been happening since he was a kid. Jesus gave the father time to respond and get the father to have emotion about the situation. And the father goes on in verse 22. It says he's often been thrown into the fire or the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. So you imagine the father's emotions coming up after Jesus asked him how long he's been doing this. 
Now imagine the father's feelings right about now. He'd been helping his son since he was almost born, caring for him, hoping that maybe one day, one day, he'd be healed or cured. But all these days and years later, nothing, nothing yet. And he's wondering, is it ever going to happen? You ever wonder that? God, are you ever going to do this? Then, he, then the father goes to the, the disciples thinking, oh, finally, these guys can do it. These guys can heal. And still nothing. So when he finally sees Jesus, you can imagine a little bit of doubt creeps into this guy's life. Jesus' disciples couldn't do it. So maybe it just can't be done. Maybe it's not going to happen. And he says what I think all of us have said at one time or another, given those circumstances. He says, but if you can do anything, please take pity on us. Help us. He trusted the disciples, and they couldn't help. And now he's wondering if Jesus, if even Jesus can do it. And Jesus responds in verse 23, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Imagine how Jesus' tone would have been during this. What would, what would you think? If? What do you mean, if? Of course I can do it. Now, the everything is possible phrase just, spoiler alert, does not mean you can ask for anything you want and anything you desire and expect God to answer that. If you believe that gravity's not real, I believe, God, I'm going to walk off this edge of this building and God, you're going to help me. It's not going to work out well for you. If you believe that God wants you to have a Cadillac simply because you want it and you deserve it, good luck. James 4.3 says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So we just can't be gimme, gimme, gimme. Not what that means. Jesus was asking the dad if he had the faith to believe that Jesus could heal him. And the dad answers the way that a lot of us have answered and we prayed. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. How many have prayed that prayer? Jesus was not asking the dad if he believed that Jesus had the power to heal. He was asking him, do you think that I will? if the dad had faith to believe that Jesus could heal. Hey, the dad was honest. Yeah, I, I kind of believe. I'm not perfect in my unbelief. His faith, his faith was mixed with doubt. How many have prayed, really believing, but in the back of mind, you have a little bit of doubt? <laughs> if, you know. The phrase that we read from the author of that book says, you don't have to have psychological certainty because I don't think anybody can have psychological certainty that God's going to do something because there's always going to be that little hinge of doubt in the back of your mind and he says you don't have to have that what you have to be certain about is what the Bible says that Jesus has compassion the Bible every time Jesus healed he had compassion on someone he healed because of the compassion that he had on people and the dad had the doubt because he'd been through the disciples. They didn't do anything. And I think our lives are always going to be mixed with questions and doubts, even through our faith. As long as our reservations are about our own ability or our own inadequacies and not with God's power and ability, God can work despite your weakness. If you think I, there's nothing in me that's worthy, there's nothing in me that does this. If God wants to do something, it's got to totally be God. And I'm going to pray to that end. God can work through you even though you're not perfect, even though you struggle with doubt. And doubt, as we studied a while ago, we did a study called Faith and Doubt. 
Doubt is a good thing because it allows you to stretch out the doubt to answer the doubt. And allows you to answer that doubt through God's word. Honest struggling with faith does not mean that Christ will not respond to your request. How many of you have thought that, well, maybe because of me, God's not going to answer that prayer? This guy had wavering faith. Right? His faith wasn't perfect. He said it. The boy probably had no faith because he's being controlled by a demon. So when you hear people say, you don't have enough faith to be healed, or if your faith was better, God would heal you. Remember that verse, verse 25. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. There was already a a crowd around him. More were running to him to see what was going on, and so Jesus had to be quick, and he healed the boy quickly before the whole rest of the crowd got there. One commentator says it this way, he did not want to perform miracles for gaping sightseers. The possession was so severe in the boy that when the demon left, it seemed like he tried his best to do as much damage on his way out. People thought he was dead. But Jesus helped him up, and he was delivered. So back to the faith issue. The boy couldn't have had faith to be healed. He was controlled by the evil spirit. The dad had minimal faith, enough to believe that Jesus could heal, but some doubt because of what he experienced before. How many have been prayed for for things for a long time and not have it answered? What happens? You kind of stop praying about it. You think God's not going to do it. But I think when the songs we sing, you keep praying. You keep praying. Maybe it's the 50th time you pray. In spite of all the doubt and the minimal faith, Jesus still, still healed that boy. Let me read one more quote from that book. It says, God doesn't demand that we have perfect theology or practice in order for him to act in our lives. I do believe, however, that this kind of teaching can be destructive. It puts the burden on the person who wants to be healed rather than putting confidence in God's goodness and his ability. It, first, it forces a person to, quote, whip up a psychological certainty for healing a certainty that God may not be giving at all. And it adds a condition for healing, the condition of psychological certainty that God does not require. Does God respond in faith? Absolutely. Does our faith need to be 100% perfect all the time? No. This guy specifically said, my faith is questionable. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're going to do it. Jesus says, you think I have the ability to do it? God said, well, yeah, I have, you have the ability to do it. God did it. It's the faith we have in God's goodness to his people, his willingness to heal, and what God's word says about him, not how we feel about it. Verse 28 says, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And these guys were probably, you know, okay, we've been doing this, but now we couldn't do it. Why couldn't we do it? Verse 29 says, he replied, this, this kind can only come out by prayer. Now, how many have a King James or a New King James Version? You probably have the word fasting after that. Fasting is not in the best manuscripts that we have available, so most translations omit that, although it's not a bad thing. It's not, it's not anti-biblical. It's just something that they added. So we're going to focus on the prayer part. Jesus' point here seems to be that disciples had taken for granted that they needed to pray for that type of ability and power. It doesn't come automatically. You don't wake up one day and think, I'm going to do what God wants me to do without praying and seeking God. Hey, we've done it before. It'll it'll keep working if we've done it before. They probably neglected prayer and thought that they they themselves had the ability instead of Jesus working through them. The power was not inherent in them. 
And what happened was they no longer depended prayerfully on God to provide it. And what they experience is what we experience if we are lax in our prayer time. We're going to be powerless. We let the devil run roughshod over us. How many of you have things that are operated by battery? What happens when the battery dies? It doesn't work, right? It's not that the thing is broken. It's just the power source isn't there. Your device goes dead. We don't have power unless we're plugged into the source. Unless we are prayed up and charged up with the Spirit of God, we have no power in ourselves. Those are microphones. They all run on battery, and they chew them up pretty fast. It's not the microphone that supplies the energy to amplify. It's the battery that provides the energy. The Holy Spirit is one that provides energy in us to be able to do what God wants us to do. Without that power, we're mortal human beings. We will not do anything. And if you're not experiencing God's power in your lives, maybe it's because we're not plugged into God's word. We're not spending time in prayer. Oh, straight up 12 o'clock? Means nothing. If you want to truly experience the gifts of the Spirit and you want to see God work, what does God say we need to do? This type only happens by prayer. God wants us to be people of prayer. And I mentioned in class today that, and I'm, I'm big. I'm, if you ask me, study your Bible, know your Bible, know what the Bible says. But I also said the Pharisees knew their Bible, in and side and out. What was the difference? They didn't practice what the Bible said. You can know all your information, but if you don't practice it, it doesn't do you any good. And if we're expecting the Holy Spirit to work, then we need to not only know our Bible, but we have to be ready to be used in the knowledge that we have. I said in Ephesians, and I said it earlier, God gave pastors, teachers, evangelists to teach God's people to do to have works of service, right? So that means that's incumbent upon me to share that with you, and it's incumbent upon you to be used by God in those areas. And that's the way the gifts of the Spirit work, through you, through what God empowers you to do. And if you are prayed up and you're ready to be used by God, then God can just do great things. But we need to be people of prayer and people of action. When James says, hey, if you read your Bible and you don't do anything with it, it's like looking in the mirror and walking away, forgetting what you look like. So we want to be people that are used by God and to be able to be used by God, we need to be prayed up and ready. How many think we're living in the last days? I mean, Tiff says the last of the last days. And you see all the, the weird and crazy and dumb things that are going on in the world. It's like, man, it could be any day now. And really nothing's got to happen before the rapture happens. If that's how we believe, How does it make us live? Do we live any differently? Do we have that sense of urgency about people who don't know Christ? I shared with the class this morning that Penn and Teller, you know the group Penn and Teller? One of the guys, I can't remember which one, the guy with the big hair, big guy. I don't know if it's Penn or Teller, but he's an atheist. I saw an interview with him once. He said, I can't believe in Christianity because if there was really an eternal hell that never stopped, you guys aren't out there preaching it. You guys aren't out there telling people about this. He says, if that were me, I would do everything in my power to make sure that nobody went there. And he says, and I don't see that. Now, he's not in church, obviously, so he doesn't experience it, but are we that way? Do we have that sense of urgency? You know, we, I don't even have this in my notes. How many have planned for your funeral? Right? Okay. Why do you do that? Because you want your family left behind not to have to worry about any of that. Right? You want to prepare all of that before you go. What happens if you don't? Everything that you've got to plan, your family now has to plan, you're left behind, they have no idea what you want to do. When we are gone, have we prepared our family and friends with the truth? 
so that when we're gone, we're dead, do they know enough that no one else has to come to them? Have we told them all that we can tell them so they can make a decision on their own after we're gone? We have to be prepared to tell them that and prepare them so when we are gone, they know and they can make a decision on that. They don't have to flounder around thinking, well, mom and dad never told me. I don't know anything about this. No one ever shared things about Jesus with me. What do I do? We need to be sure that we prepare people so that when we are gone, we have sufficiently given them enough information. I'll, I'll close with this. I did this before. How many have seen Schindler's List, the end of Schindler's List? At the very end, you know, that the, the, it's an, a true story. Oscar Schindler was a German uh, entrepreneur. And he realized that if he, would, he could buy Jews from the camps and employ them to keep them from being killed. And at the very end of the movie, war's over, and he realizes, he says, I could, I could have sold my ring and, and saved five more people. I could have sold my car and saved 10 more people. I could have sold all this and saved more people. We don't want to get that way. We want to be sure that everything we have now, we expend to make sure that people get saved. So that when our life is over, we don't look back and say, you know what, I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have done... We want to make sure that everything we do pours into sharing the gospel with people. And that's everybody. That's all of us. So when we get to heaven, God can say, well done. Not, you know, you kind of missed the mark on that one. I want to hear well done. Amen? Would you stand as we close this morning? And bow your heads for a moment. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been in church all your life or maybe this is your first or second or third time. But the question is still the same. We don't, we don't get to heaven because we go to church. We don't get to heaven because we sing songs or listen to sermons. We get to heaven because we have made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. We recognize that in ourselves we are never going to be good enough to make it to heaven. That we are full of sin and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Separation from God for eternity. God doesn't send anybody to hell. He allows you to choose where you want to live. And by not choosing Christ now, you are in fact, by default, choosing hell later. And the Bible says that Jesus came to deliver all of us from that. His word says he's long-suffering. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. That's everyone. He doesn't want anyone to go there. It wasn't designed for us. The Bible says it was designed for the devil and his angels. So if you're here and you've never made that commitment, you've never come to the point where you said, yes, I'm a sinner and I trust in what Jesus did and only what Jesus did to get me into heaven. The sacrifice he did was for me. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You can have that assurance. We sang blessed assurance. You can have that hope that when you die, you will be in paradise. The Bible says these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. Not doubt, not guess, not hope, but think you may know you have eternal life. If you've never made that commitment, you're here for that purpose this morning, to make that commitment. Jesus is offering you the chance to make it this morning. If you're online watching, Jesus has given you the opportunity to make that choice now. You may not have another choice. You may not have another day to make that choice. So if you're here and you want to make that choice right now, I want you to raise your hand. Maybe you're here and you've, you made that commitment a long time ago, but your life is not a, re, a reflection of that commitment. You said a prayer, but now you're, you're kind of living like you want to live and you're not really doing much with it. Well, the Bible says that you keep doing that, you're going to eventually walk away from God. When times get tough, you're going to walk away. Well, today's the day to renew that commitment. To make sure you're on firm ground, as we sang, a firm foundation that you trusted Jesus and your life has been transformed from the inside out. The person you were is no longer the person that you are now. If 
that's you. And I believe there's some here that are in that boat. I want you to raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for what Jesus has accomplished for us. And we thank you for his faithfulness. As we heard in the testimony, how you provided, how you guided, you steered every situation in spite of what it looked like on the outside. And Lord, you do the same for all of us. Your word says that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. So even things that we think are bad and harmful, your word says you will turn all of it around for good. We will see your hand in, in all of it at some point. Lord, I pray that you would fill each person here with that Holy Spirit. Allow us not just to be energized and expecting in the four walls of this church, but help us to be used by you in the world. Give us that sense of urgency to share Christ with those we come in contact with so that when our life is over, we will have expended all that we could to get people into the kingdom. Father, we love you this morning. And we're so thankful for your goodness to us. And I just pray your blessings upon each person as we leave this morning. Allow us to really sense your presence every day. Every day, Lord. And allow us to respond to that and act according to what your word tells us to do. And we'll thank you for all of it now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Have a good day off tomorrow. Cook out if you're going to have one. See you next Sunday.